Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court ruled most provisions of the cybercrime law constitutional, including the controversial provision punishing online libel. The court struck down three sections declaring the provisions on unsolicited commercial communications, real-time collection of data, and the so-called takedown clause all illegal. Welcome to Talk Thursday. With us today to talk about the decisions are technology law expert JJ Decini and lawyer Chris Lau, who joins us on Phone Patch. Decini is one of the lawyers who petitioned against the cybercrime law last year. If you notice, it's his name that goes up against the government. Lau was a victim of cyberbullying when he was thrust into the spotlight in 2011 because of a video that went viral online. Gentlemen, good day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, having us. Thank you for having me. Chris, it's Thank good you. to talk to you again. Let me throw it to JJ. JJ, your reaction to the decisions. Uh, so in, in my case, uh, I'm uh, two for four uh, in terms of the attack. I, I uh, questioned four provisions of the Cybercrime Prevention Act, and the two of those were, uh, were granted by the court. The other two, uh, I was denied. Uh, the other two, of course, that where I was denied was on the provision on libel, and the other one were the provisions on um, double jeopardy. The double liability and increased penalty for uh, cyber crime, cyber crimes, in relation to the revised penal code, that was kept by the court. It was. It was. That strangely enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. this means that people who are actually online, like Rappler, we can we can we get double the. That's the funny thing. So the Supreme Court said that uh, libel is constitutional, but then they said that the they said that and 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 they upheld the the increased penalty in the Cybercrime Prevention Act, but you can't be prosecuted under both. So you, the, the complainant has to choose. And it's an exception they only made for libel. So all other, all other uh, mm -hmm. offenses in the revised penal code, you can be convicted twice. Double jeopardy. Double jeopardy. That's but but for libel, they said, no, you, you choose whether one you go or one or the other. So oh. I thought that's a little strange. I'm looking forward to the decision to see how they made that fine distinction. Interesting. Chris, you have yeah. first-hand experience. How did you react to the decision? Oh, uh, well, uh, I expected the decision. Uh, uh, before I made the distinction between the takedown clause and online libel, that one is an abridgment of freedom of expression, speech, um, because regardless of the content, uh, there is censorship. Whereas the other one, online libel, you, you're not being censored, you can, you're free to speak your mind, provided that if it's in, in the process, if it injures somebody, you, you are, are going to answer for that. So, um, there, so I expected the decision. For me, it's correct. Uh, um, online libel is just uh, a different medium. Uh, we have libel in the revised penal code. So if that is uh, um, held to be legal, uh, and online libel is just uh, an extension of uh, an extension of that, um, it appears to be a different medium. So it should be also um, upheld. Interesting. JJ, um, your reaction to Chris, I guess part of this is that this spurred in the last few days a massive online conversation, right. people saying that this provision on online libel is against freedom of expression. That's right, many people um, have said that. For, so for both of you gentlemen, uh, your reaction, I mean, what exactly does online libel mean and is does it hit freedom of expression? Actually, online libel, to the extent that you can go to jail for uh, expressing your opinion, um, uh, is, is a limitation on the freedom of expression. Uh, but, um, you know, in, in the context of uh, social media, uh, I think people need to understand that if the person you're speaking about is a public figure, or um, a public figure or a public officer, say a politician, then uh, you have greater protections, you cannot be convicted. Um, they, you have, the complainant has to show that you act, had actual malice when making that statement. And, the, and this is the New York Times versus Sullivan uh, decision in the U.S., which has been adopted in the Philippines, where um, th th there is a need for uh, greater public discussion of matters of public interest, especially those that involve governance, and that uh, politicians or people who engage in, in uh, pu the public life should not be permitted to sue uh, a person for libel as a way to control public discussion of uh, matters of public interest. So it seems, in, in general, the discussion we're seeing online, you're saying it's not a fear that there are yes. protections against there that. are protections I think what people should be uh, be more concerned about are situations where they're saying something negative about a private individual now in those situations like someone who's not a public figure right. that's where that person will come back and sue you for libel well it's interesting and Chris you were exactly in that position where you were 
you you said this. I remember you saying, you know, credibility was your your biggest asset. You were going to be a lawyer. I guess how did you how do you react to this thing this clause about online libel? Well, um, reputation is as much a pro, uh, as much a constitutional right as um, life, liberty, property. So um, it should it deserves protection. And um, so if somebody destroys that, you should answer. Um, but that's not abusement of freedom of expression. It's it's wrong to say that um, having this law curtails freedom of expression speech. You can still say whatever it is you want, um, but if that injures somebody, you have to, to answer for that. And I think we have sufficient protection because you're not going to answer for something that, that you're not supposed to answer to, meaning if you didn't commit a crime, um, you you you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna be liable for anything. Um, I believe we have sufficient safeguards. Uh, the Constitution says that no person should be solely what um, be be uh, I know, um, be imprisoned uh, solely on uh, solely on his beliefs, so on and so forth. And then uh, everybody has uh, a right to due process of law, and then uh, nobody is to answer for criminal prosecutions um, without due process of law, so on and so forth. Do you agree with, with Chris? You, um, you know, when, when you're under threat uh, of going to jail for, uh, for, ex for, uh, for expressing your opinion, certainly it will give you pause. Uh, and in that sense, uh, your freedom of expression is curtailed. Um, you're, you, will, you will stop yourself from saying something simply because of the, the belief that you might go to jail. And, and one of the problems about libel is that a lot of it has to do, I mean, it's, it's a pretty tricky area of the law. And in fact, uh, in many instances, you can ask a lawyer whether something is libelous and he, he might, you might get two or different opinions. So what, what, in a situation where the law is not so clear mm -hmm. on whether you're going to go to jail, then the only way to protect yourself is to be even more conservative about what you say in public. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is an even greater curtailment, I think, in my view. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're less free. I mean, he's, uh, Chris is right. You're free. You can state that. You can say, say anything you want, but uh, you can say anything you want, but you can go to jail. So I'd rather say whatever I want and not go to jail. So um, I think that that would be freedom of expression. One of the I think the fear. This, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I think it's the fear is on uh, abuse. So right. it's not really on the merits of the law. I mean, we we fear that the decision might be against you, but we have guidelines. I mean. Um, it's it, people. People have to be. They, they just have to know. Uh, I think that um, uh, everybody is expected not to be ignorant about the law. They should know the law, and then uh, the law is pretty clear that uh, libel ha, libel has standards. So you, you're not going to commit this simply because you say something, so on and so forth. There's this other, I, and I, again, I see this online all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I want to hear how you both react to it. They're saying that this is very good that online libel is actually has been declared constitutional because the rights of your rights and where others' rights begin. Is that correct? Is that a correct perspective of looking at this? Should you be more careful about what I, I, you say Certainly, online? I think that's the message that uh, the Cybercrime Prevention Act is, uh, and it's certainly the president, I think, wants to send that message as well. You have to be responsible for what you say online. Um, but my, my concern is not so much the ordinary libel between private individuals. My concern is really the, the chilling effect of public officials filing cases when they really don't have the right to file those cases. Even last year, the cyber perling case I thought was, was very, uh, was instructive. Uh, the TRO of the Supreme Court was in place. Here was a, a, an individual criticizing the mayor of her town for something that he did involving the exercise of his authority. And then she is slapped with a, with a libel case. Now, I understand what uh, Chris is saying, that th there's due process, she will eventually be acquitted. True, but that will take maybe two or three years to happen. And it, she would have to spend money to defend herself. Uh, it would take time from away from uh, whatever it is she's supposed to be doing. And in that sense, it's a curtailment of, of her freedom. Uh, and it, it, if you have to pay money in order to, def to assert your rights, um, simply because uh, as a consequence of, uh, of exp expressing yourself, then it's a cost to, to exercising your freedom of ex expression. And li libel, in a sense, is a cost, I think. Uh, and I would rather have it decriminalized. Yes, you, you will answer for it, but you'd answer it for money. Correct. Not, not to, uh, you don't need to go to jail. Some of the senators have said, though, that's another fight now. That's another uh, initiative that turning libel, that they seem to say online libel should be labeled libel, much as the president did. Yes. Um, but that the next step is to try to decriminalize libel. Do you agree with that, that these are different things? I don't think there's a really a difference between online libel and libel. I think Chris, will, Chris and I will agree here.
hear yep. that. Online libel is just another medium through which the libel occurred, um, another means of Correct. publication. Um, but um, I, I think the, the concern is that online libel is more damaging because uh, a lot more people are paying attention to what's going on online. Uh, and, and its ability to spread, which is exactly. kind of interesting, right? Because and be archived. And, and searchable forever. Right, right. Right. So the effect on your reputation is uh, is uh, so, so it's stickier than uh, than a uh, libel, say on broadcast media or on, on print. Correct, right. Chris. It's interesting because again, you were a victim of cyberbullying, and mm -hmm. you spoke very eloquently about this uh, two years ago at the Social Good Summit. Um, can I ask you? So this thing the, in the Supreme Court decision, they actually say only the person who said it is liable for libel, yeah. but anyone else who retweets it or or right. spreads it is not. Do you think right. that's right? Yeah, I think that's right because uh, malice cannot be inferred from merely retweeting or liking something. I mean, uh, I don't think um, by liking something you impute, you know, you, you impute a crime, a vice defect, or any act condition that, sen that tends to um, uh, cause the dishonor of another person. It's just not clear there uh, what your what, what, what's going on through your mind? I mean, nothing can be inferred that's but malicious. Can I be devil's advocate to both of you on this one? Um, in general, if you look at the power of the internet, that really is the power of the internet, its ability to spread it virally. Yes. So we're right. actually saying, okay, somebody can sell the knife, but whatever anyone does with the knife afterwards is okay. Am I? Okay. Well, please. So, he, he, uh, so, so, um, I mean, let's go back to the language of, I mean, it's funny we're talking about the Supreme Court decision that yes. none of us have read. Yes, exactly. This is a f we're in a funny situation here. Uh, yeah. So we're in, uh, we're in the twilight zone. Uh, so we're guessing what's in the decision. All Correct. we have is the results of the voting. Right. Right. So uh, according, as uh, they said, it's constitutional but unconstitutional. Uh, in other words, you can, uh, you're free from liability if you, and uh, the court said, I think, simply receive and react. Okay. So I, I would like to think that the, the word react isn't, isn't a license to say that I'm not liable because I'm just reacting. I would like to think that the word simply also applies to react. In other words, simply receive I or see. simply react. And so when you just like, yes. when you put a smiley face, when you do a thumbs up, when ah. you indicate uh, a simple reaction, make a simple reaction to the libelous material, you are not liable. Mm -hmm. But I think if you react in such a way that you uh, add, so for example, the, the libelous material is that this yeah. guy is corrupt, and then you say not only that, he's, he's, a, he's a murderer too, Correct. then you are liable for libel as well, because that would be a libelous statement. Yes. And then um, on the sharing, it's a little trickier. I, yes. I think if you're sharing a link, let's say on uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. and you say, this is a libelous uh, article, and then you, you, sh you share the link. My sense is that there's no libel there. That is not republication of libel, mm -hmm. because all you're saying, all you're doing there is you're pointing to the location of where the libelous material is. It's yes. like me, hey, Maria, go to, uh, go to the library, look at this book. It's on page 323. So I'm just telling you where it is. Republication means that I will cut, mm -hmm. I will paste the libelous text, and I will s move it forward. That, I think, that type of sharing, if you're cutting and pasting the libelous article, I think that would constitute republication and, and r subject you to, to, uh, to uh, liability under yes. the libel law. I yeah. agree, because in that case, you're adopting it as your own, as opposed to just merely um, liking. Correct. Well, let's take, wow. Chris, your case again as a case study, right? Um, because it, was, it did reach such viral proportions. Who's li who would be liable under Chris's case? And uh, this is already past that period where he could file. So <laughs> right. please, gentlemen, so as lawyers, discussion. yes, this is a nice <laughs> academic discussion. Sorry, Chris. Um, who will be liable? Is it the network who first aired the video? What about the guys who cut the clip and made it go viral, reposted it? What happens in that case? We all know what happened with Chris, right? Chris was uh, yes. uh, on a GMA. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Tell us what Go happened. Uh, yes, yes. Oh uh, yes, I was. Uh, yeah, uh, I was up caught on cam by a um, broadcast company, and uh, I think it was aired in, uh, in a way that would um, elicit a response, a calculated response from the audience, and uh, uh, so I was pretty as an arrogant, uh, entitled um, brat whining about everything and then uh, putting the blame on everybody else except himself so the, as a result of that um netflix reacted and uh, said a lot of nasty things um against me and then they spread uh videos about me with libelous captions 
So who would be liable? So here's the funny thing about that, right? So the, uh, at, the, at the very first stage, at the time when the first video came out, Chris Lau was uh, a private citizen. He was. He was not a public figure. He was just some guy who got caught in the flood, uh, in the flood uh, near, a, near uh, ABS-CBN. Right. And um, later, when it had gone viral, he had ceased to become a private citizen. I think he had become what's known as a quasi-public figure, where you're a public figure in relation to something else. In this case, you're a public figure because of that particular viral video. And I think that at that point, it would have been harder for Chris to file a libel case because he would have to establish actual malice uh, before he could bring a, a libel suit. In other words, uh, the protections of uh, New York Times versus Sullivan kicks in. The, the tricky part is when will it kick in? Yes. When, will it, when can you say that uh, Chris Lau is no longer uh, he is a now a public figure. Correct. He's no longer a, uh, uh, a private citizen, a private citizen because rights. the context now has shifted. Yes. So um, it's not very clear when that happened, but it's, it's obvious that uh, uh, maybe two or three days later when everyone, uh, when, when the hits are, were so high, I think he had already become a public figure. So the, sort of the law changes as the circumstances changes. Right, so circumstances change, I see. How interesting. Right. And then, Chris, for you, I mean, now it's several years, and I apologize if I was blunt with the way I stated it. I know it was very hurtful at the <laughs> time for you, but I guess during that time period, looking back on it, would it have helped you if you had this law? Could it have helped you? Siguro doon sa pag-track down, doon sa by equipping our um enforcers the necessary skills to be able to uh, pinpoint the culprit baka doon sa aspeto na yun that's right makakatulong uh oh that's right would it uh -oh. have helped i guess the other thing is you know you were really it had an impact on you what happened that it was yeah. cyber right, bullying right. tell us yeah, the but impact one of my, on you Go one, ahead. Of, one of the main obstacles was to but to identify the perpetrators at the time um uh, um if had i gone to the authorities they wouldn't have um, they wouldn't have um, addressed my problem because uh, hindi nila alam paano tapos yun, so on and so forth but uh, siguro sa law na to they have that um, duty now it's clear that uh, this is uh, an offense and uh, they also cannot um, feel ignorance uh, because they're supposed to know how to address these things they're supposed to know how to track down the perpetrators. That's right. Interesting. And actually now, uh, and so going now to the pros and cons of the law, I mean certainly... Before we go oh, there, sorry, can go I there. ask you, yeah. to, go, to go back to that one, is the network liable in a situation like that? Because you could arguably say that Chris Lau was a private citizen before they posted it. Uh, that's interesting, that's right? That's an interesting question. Right. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, with, if the data privacy law were in place, yes. right, uh, certainly what the, what they should have done, the protocol should have been, they should have blocked out his face. They should have pixelated his face. There was no need for, there was no need to identify who he was. In fact, I think if you watch the video, the video doesn't, doesn't put his name. Yes. So in other words, he's just some motorist. Yes. But, the, but, the, but the face was visible. Correct. And therefore you could identify him. And indeed he was, he was identified very quickly. And then all, and it's just, it was just a perfect storm. Uh, I think for Chris, uh, he was a law student and uh, saying, how can, and it, it, the, the stuff he was saying didn't make any sense because it was said out of, it was taken out of context. Correct. So it's just a perfect storm for him. And, uh, and that's why he became uh, the victim of cyber bullying. I think in the end it became a, an issue of cyber bullying. So then let's move forward. Pros and cons. Right. Of this so law. taking taking the cue from what uh, Chris was saying, um, you know, the, the 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 good things about this law is that uh, two two things that uh, jump out at me. The first is that if you look at the I think the first four sections of the law, they are defining different types of cyber crimes, and these definitions are very consistent. In fact, almost word for word with the Budapest Convention. Yes. Now the Budapest Convention is this, this is the International Treaty on Cybercrime. Um, this treaty. Uh, is uh, adopt has been adopted all throughout Europe, adopted by the United States, yes. by Japan and China, mm -hmm. which means that since our cyber crimes are defined in the same way as in all these other places, when we later when we ask these countries for assistance in law enforcement uh, uh, events, right? So they say, we need uh, we're investigating, for example, um, illegal interception. Then these countries don't need to ask us what an illegal interception is. It's easier for for law enforcement agencies to coordinate on an inter international basis. And since a lot of cyber crimes are uh, cross border in nature, so that will help. Okay. And the second thing that's important is the authority given to our law enforcement agencies to uh, compel service providers to preserve data, mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to to give up 
data and gives guidance on what sort of authority the courts have uh, to assist law enforcement uh, agencies in getting the, the evidence necessary to identify these perpetrators. So in the case of Chris, for Chris, example, he right. could have gone to the PNP uh, anti-cybercrime group, and then these mm -hmm. guys, they would then go to the telcos and say, okay, give me, who's, who's using this IP? Who's, who is uh, assigned to this IP address? Whose phone number is this? And on that basis, they could then get a, a search warrant, and then they could take it, take, move it forward, identify these people, and start filing cases. Interesting. So, yeah. And for you, Chris, the pros and cons? Yeah. Uh, of the, which one? The, uh, of this, of the decision of the Supreme Court. Pros and cons. Hmm. Well, um, I, I like the decision. Uh, I have yet to read it, as uh, Professor Dufin said. Uh, we, I, I have to see the nuances of the decision. Um, the, the verdict may be correct, but I don't know how they arrived at the verdict, so I, I would like to see the nuances. I'd like to see the, the reasoning behind each uh, decision. But for online libel, uh, yeah, uh, I'm okay with it. Again, uh, if we have a problem with the penalty, it's, uh, it's a subject that's delegated to the wisdom of Congress and if they deem it to be to be uh, if they deem it to be uh, necessary in order to deter whatever it is that they want to deter then uh, so be it uh, the way to, to 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 make a change is to to lobby for our congressmen to change their decision so it's not going to be uh, it's not within the uh, the powers of review of the court Correct, right. correct. So let me just throw this from the social media. There, there yeah. is a lot of concern about online libel. And you know, just to clarify, Section 7, which is about the liability of the cybercrime, uh, a cyber criminal under other laws, was actually declared unconstitutional on two fronts, not just online libel, but also on the, um, in terms of child pornography. Child pornography, that's correct. correct. So those two. Right. And they, the Supreme Court cited the guarantee against double jeopardy. That's right. Um, as outlined in the Constitution. That's the reason why they said they, they in deciding Section yeah. 7. I think for child pornography, the reason why, if you see, it, they also applied it for Section 5, right. child pornography. I think the reason f is that um, in the child pornography law, uh, it already provides for penalties for those who aid in the vet. Yes. It also provides for penalties for uh, uh, child see. pornography using through electronic means. Okay. So they, they could clearly see an overlap. That yes. That's the same offense and then you're, you're it's just too confusing when you try to apply it in, in this context. So I think that's why they struck it down. Okay. So yeah. let, let me throw you some questions and again these this is from uh, social media from Christopher Pangan. Would memes about public officials or civilians be considered libelous? Our people have always entertained themselves by making fun of people in power or famous people. I mean, uh, certainly um, memes of a, a humorous nature uh, that comment on, uh, say, public, public officials, I think are probably not libelous. Uh, on the whole, because these are, as I said, there's probably no proof of actual malice in these, uh, in these types of uh, uh, expression. So I think it would be very difficult for a public official to, to sue for uh, to sue successfully for libel. The problem is that, as I mentioned, there's a difference between suing somebody for libel and making somebody suffer for the, for the lawsuit. So Correct. He, he may the, the the journalist might eventually win, or the netizen might eventually win the case, but the cost to him might be so big okay. that uh, the damage is actually there. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Chris Derek Ross is asking, "What does online libel cover that the existing law on libel does not? Should the public have been informed?" It's just another medium. So, so uh, the rules on libel apply. So the there's same, not really any rules. difference. Yes. Um, just to go back uh, to the public officials. Well. Um, the right to criticize public officers does not authorize defamation. No one has the right to invade, to invade another's privacy, but uh, um, but the conduct of public officials are held to uh, to be matters of public interest. So uh, they are common property. So um, it's a uh, it is a defense to an action by a private uh, by uh, to an action for libel uh, by these public officials that uh, these were just uh, comments on matters of public interest. So. Uh, people shouldn't fear that they can no longer criticize the government because public officials are held to a different standard, absolutely. 
Uh, can I just say something go, about that, that question, uh, particularly that part where they're saying, I should, uh, should the general public have been informed? Um, you know, this is an interesting, this concern about uh, libel is actually an interesting development. And, and this is because uh, previous to this, uh, to this uh, day and age, prior to um, the blogosphere, prior to uh, individuals going directly to the audience, uh, the only people who were charged with libel are organized media. Correct. So print, uh, radio, uh, broadcast. Uh, these are the people who were concerned about libel. The ordinary individual was not concerned about libel because he, he would never had a chance to commit libel. With the internet, with technology uh, uh, going down, making it more affordable for people to express themselves to a wider audience, right. they are now taking the place of media and right. they are now, suddenly they find themselves in a situation where doing something that they were doing before in a very small scale, I mean, saying, speaking your mind at the, in front of the tindahan or in the bar while you're talking to your friends. Gossip. Gossip, <laughs> right? Well, you could do that without, without fear of reprisal. When you do it online, suddenly you feel that, um, you know, suddenly there's all these responsibilities. That's why media is saying, you know, this is old hat. We've Correct. been dealing with this for years. Yes. Uh, but for people coming in, this is really the change uh, brought about by technology. Yes. And so people uh, have either, well, they, ha they have no choice, right? They have to follow the law. Uh, but it's it's a it's a conflict we will see time and again where yes. where people who are merely consumers of uh, information are now creators of information and now they feel the responsibilities that uh, that have always hounded creators yes. uh, whether it's intellectual issues or privacy issues or or libel so I think it's just part of that larger trend and um, and I think what will have to happen is that we will have to have a conversation on what sort of responsibilities we're going to impose on these people but I think it's a bit too early to tell where this is all headed. We haven't seen the law yet. We haven't right? seen no. We haven't seen where where this is all going to. Will is the trend towards say blogging or individual expression mm. on the web? Will that continue or will it go the way of broadcasting? So initially in the early days of broadcast, there were uh, supposedly um, you know sort of very weak uh, radio signals mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. husbands and wives would, would have these like uh, mom and pop shows. And, but later, it professionalized mm -hmm. and organized itself uh, through broadcasting companies. Will we see that online? Right, right now, it's, it's uh, wild, wild west. Will the big companies come in and start buying and, and consolidating? And when they consolidate the internet into, into massive conglomerates, then I don't think it'll go it that way, but anyway, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. if it goes that way, then the law that we have now might actually work. If it goes the other way, yes. then the law has to change, but we don't, we, we don't know where it's headed. Right. So. Well, if you look at it, though, we're seeing the trend, which is the long tail. So mm -hmm. you have more and more of less and less, right? right so right. That's, that's what we've had. But you've just characterized the discussion that we're seeing online right now. Right. There are many groups who are up in arms about the cybercrime law, but you know, to professional journalists, we just say, well, we've always been under those types of that's laws. Right. Uh, how do you assess assuage uh, the consumer now. I mean, frankly, they oh, yeah. really shouldn't be saying things that are, that could be potentially libelous. Is that correct? I think the, the sense that I, get, uh, that I get is that um, these are uh, sort of the adults. The, the decision represents the opinion of adults telling everyone else, you know, you have to calm down online, mm -hmm. you have to be responsible about what you say, and you have to uh, make sure that you don't hurt people as much as possible. Um, I think the, uh, the harm is not so much uh, in, in terms of the, the individual space uh, or the private space. I think the harm um, of libel is really in the public sphere where... Uh, um, it can be used to chill. As to a chill, chill yeah. and for people to hide right. behind libel so that uh, they will be freed from criticism about things that they should be criticized about. Correct. Right. Um, let me ask, there's one last major chunk uh, on the data privacy. The Supreme Court said no to government's real-time collection of traffic data. So That's they right. said that was unconstitutional. But they say yes to the preservation of computer data in um, Section 13, right? That's right. What's the difference? And why rule differently on real time versus archives? Okay, so um, uh, let's say uh, there's a hacking incident that happened that's yeah. happening on that's ongoing, and the PNP is aware of it. So the, the PNP then calls the service provider and say, "Look, uh, there's a there's a hacking incident that's going on right now. Please preserve all the data that you have yep. with respect to this IP address. We're not going to get it yet. We just want you to preserve it. We're uh, going to go to court. court we're going to go to court. Yeah, we're going to go to I court. See. Get a search warrant, and we'll get it later. But for now, just preserve it. Don't delete it. Mm -hmm. oh, so now that that. So there's no question there, right? The, yes. the, the content is disclosed when a search warrant is in place. Now, that's different from Section 12. Section 12 says that upon, uh, I think, a uh, mere good cause, 
mm -hmm. uh, to be determined by the law enforcement agencies. Yes. They can initiate sur what, what I would call surveillance, and that's real-time collection of traffic right. data. That's like I can look at your cell phone and I see who's, what numbers are calling you and what numbers you're dialing and right. what numbers are sending you messages and what numbers are, are you sending messages to. And um, although the argument is that that's all anonymous data, we know it's not too difficult to de-anonymize that data. And all we're saying, actually, this is I, I actually did the oral arguments on this section, and all we're saying is that you know they can do that, they can do real-time collection, but get a warrant. Yeah. Uh, what I want is I want a judge to yeah. to be there and say, look, uh, suspected cyber criminals have rights to. Let's try to protect their right to privacy. The law enforcement has a job to do, but let's let's put someone in the room who will protect the rights of, of citizens. And I think that's that's the value of striking down that provision. Fantastic. This yeah. is so incredible, all of this. Your last yes. thoughts, Chris, let me ask you, your last thoughts on this moving forward. Um, well, I think uh, don't be afraid to speak your mind, people. Just uh, um, for as long as you, you know, you're not, uh, you don't have any malice in doing these things, saying these things, there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, the law is just um, so. Uh, it, I, for me, it it but because of decision decision, it it is it's still just. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And JJ. Um, what, what what can I say except uh, I think uh, we have to we have to first read the decision so then we yes. can have a, make, make an educated yes yes uh, made, educated I know we're opinions. ahead of the game <laughs> yeah, we're ahead of the game yeah. uh, um, well I think you know we should watch what what will happen next I think the conversation is going to continue there will be motions for reconsideration yes the 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 matter will be brought up before the court again and and I think people will hope that the, the court will. Um, uh, so revisit some of the, some of the things that, that they've decided upon. Let's read the decision, look for the MRs, and maybe in six or seven months' time we'll see where we are. Fantastic. Well, the other thing that's interesting is there are no systems really in place for law enforcement to have to handle all of these things. So all of those They're systems will have to, to be created, we'll have right? To be built that's right. Yeah. So right. we're going to. It's going to be an interesting time, but certainly something that shows technology has that's is right. changing the game. That's right. We have been speaking with law expert JJ Decini and lawyer Chris Lau about this recent Supreme Court ruling on the cybercrime law. Gentlemen, thank you so much thank for you. joining us thank on you. Talk Thursday. Thank, thank you so thank much, Chris, Rappler. JJ. Thank you. Thank uh, I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us. Continue the conversation. Chris is on Twitter at, at I am Chris Lau and JJ, you're also at JJ Um Knowledgeable gentleman with first-hand experience. Thank you.